This is a lesson on the properties of electromagnetic waves in the light and optics unit. I wanted to start first with a review of waves, just a, the fundamental principles of waves that we will be bringing along into light. First of all, waves are disturbances that carry energy. That's their fundamental purpose is to carry energy from point A to point B. And we will see that with light. We'll see the simple harmonic motion and periodic quantities that we see with waves that exhibit simple harmonic motion. Uh, period, amplitude, wavelength, frequency. We also know wave speed. This will still be relevant. We're still dealing with a wave and it, this wave speed is true for light as well. The principle of superposition and interference of waves is something that we'll get into in a few lessons. But knowing that light acts like a wave. There are many properties that waves have that we are going to drag along and utilize with light. To look at light more specifically, we think about the quantities. What is the thing propagating the energy? And when we look at light, it's the electric and magnetic fields. And so we see that light carries electromagnetic energy away from a light source. And this is, um, if you get asked, how is light created? It's created by oscillating or accelerating an electric charge. I will say more about this on the next slide, but you can see over in this diagram, this is the standard model for light that we have in science. And what I found about this diagram is that it can be misleading because light does not have dimension. Light is a ray that moves through space. This diagram makes it look like light has dimension, but remember light just goes straight through space. So there is no dimension around that arrow. When we look at this graph, this is a magnitude, the magnitude of the electric field and the magnitude of the magnetic field. So remember, we can have a field at a point and this vector just represents how large that is. That's a way of representing that magnitude of that vector. So there's the electric field and the magnetic field. You can see them there. And I'll get into more properties of them, but that's the standard model that we have. Electromagnetic waves are composed of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Notice that they oscillate through time. It's not a constant value. They oscillate through time, and this is sinusoidal. We're also going to notice that this is a transverse wave. The electric field and the magnetic field oscillate in dimensions perpendicular to the actual direction of propagation of the wave. So that's what makes it transverse. We'll also see that the electric field and the magnetic field are in phase with one another. If one goes to zero, the other goes to zero. If one peaks, the other will peak. The last and final property inherent with the propagation of electromagnetic waves, of an electric field and a magnetic field, is that we know that electric fields and magnetic fields require no medium in order to exist. They exist in space somehow, which is also a future lesson. So there's no medium required to propagate. Light propagates through a vacuum. Uh, three ways light can travel from a source to another location. It can come directly from the source. It can arrive after being reflected, and we're going to study reflection in a few lessons. And it can arrive through various media. For example, it goes through glass before it gets to you. Um, and so we're also going to study that effect in a few lessons. Next is the speed of light. The study of the speed of light begins with Maxwell's equations. And uh, Maxwell uh, predicted the speed of light mathematically through these equations. And you can see that these are several that have been studied so far in physics up until this point. Gauss's law is about electric fields and relationship to charge. Gauss's law for magnetism talks about magnetic flux, how much magnetic flux passes through in a closed surface. Faraday's law talks about magnetic flux and electric field. So there's a relationship between changing magnetic flux and electric field. That's induction. And then the Ampere-Maxwell law says that there's a relationship between changing electric flux and magnetic field. So that's where we're seeing that accelerating charges create light. We have to have an accelerating charge in order to get a changing electric field. 
and a changing electric field will induce a changing magnetic field and vice versa. And what we see is that light is mutually inducing. These two fields in light are mutually inducing. It turns out if you do a very nice integral, you can derive the speed of light from these equations and that's the speed of light. And there's this nice relationship here. We are relating it to magnetic fields and electric fields, and you can see that in the equation. Mu naught goes with magnetic fields. We've seen mu naught a lot with magnetic fields. Epsilon naught, we saw that with electric fields and electric charges. And so both of these cosmological quantities, these are set by the cosmos, right, relate to the speed of light. So the speed of light is this special property of light. And there's the value there. Uh, we approximate it 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So just like sound waves have a, a speed in air and a speed in water, etc., and you can look those up, the speed of light is a very well-known constant value. Uh, this is true in a vacuum. When we enter a medium, it will slow down, and that's a study for a future lesson. But now that we have the speed of light established, we can go back to the wave equation. So as with all forms of wave, any forms of wave, the speed of the wave is lambda times the frequency. And that is true for light too. So we can take this value that we know for the speed of light and we can relate it to the wavelength of the wave and the frequency of the wave. And I didn't choose any example problem to go with this because at this point you should have seen the material and you're familiar with how to use this equation. It's a pretty simple equation. What I did want to highlight is that you may struggle recognizing situations and problems where you need to use it. So as you're working through these problems, there will be repetition on remembering the speed of light and how it relates to the wavelength and the frequency. The next property of light I'm going to introduce is the pointing vector. And this is a little bit more from the calculus version where we think about an, uh, the electric field and the magnetic field and their orientation and the direction of the intensity of the, the, the energy propagation of that wave. And so an electromagnetic wave these two fields in this wave are related to one another. And this is called the pointing vector. The pointing vector it points in the direction of propagation. So you can see this, um, I borrowed this from Hewitt Conceptual Physics. This is the direction of wave travel along this direction. And the electric field and magnetic field are always perpendicular to one another. And what we know about a cross product is that order matters. So when you get your right hand rule out in order to do the cross product, you will want to line up the electric field and then the magnetic field and then the direction of propagation will be perpendicular. And what we're seeing is all of those are perpendicular to one another. Uh, S, this pointing vector, is an intensity. So I know it's kind of weird. P, we have the pointing vector, so you think maybe this would be a P, but it's an S. And then um, it's an intensity, so it should maybe be an I. And so whenever I think of the pointing vector, I go immediately to intensity I. And you know how to calculate that, power over area. What the pointing vector also shows us is that the magnitude of the electric field and the magnetic field are related to one another. Right? We know the direction of the wave. We know its quantity, how fast it moves. And from this, we can get that these two magnitudes are related to one another. So if I know the magnitude of the electric field and the magnitude of the magnetic field, if I divide those two, I will get the speed of light. They are a constant ratio. It's a constant ratio in space. And so that goes back to these two being in phase with one another. If the electric field is zero, the magnetic field is zero. If the electric field is at a maximum value, the magnetic field is at a maximum value. And you can see that um, if I did a ratio of those two quantities through time, it would be this constant value C. Very interesting. So light is a very, very interesting wave. Uh, it requires no medium. It has this great velocity. Uh, the electric and magnetic fields um, are perpendicular to one another. It's exhibiting really interesting characteristics for a wave. It's a very special wave. 
So when we look at the electric and magnetic fields in the electromagnetic wave, I'm going to highlight here that these are all perpendicular to each other. And there is an order to it, like I mentioned on the previous slide. And this is how I do it. This is, um, this is equivalent to flat hand, right hand rule, um, but I use my three fingers and this really keeps everything perpendicular to one another. And how you can think about it is always thumb is first, then finger, then the middle and it goes X, Y, Z. This is an easy way to get axes, to, to just show some axes. But it's always electric field, magnetic field, direction of propagation. Those are always perpendicular to one another. You may be asked to figure out the direction of a field for a problem. I'm going to leave relating the electric field and magnetic field to the intensity for a future lesson and focus more on the wave equation, these wave properties of light. And what we're going to look at is the wavelength. And this is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. You can see that the speed of light is related to the wavelength and the frequency. So we categorize light based on its wavelength. What is its wavelength? And so you can see radiation type, and I guess um, I'll say that um, light is considered radiation. Uh, the wavelength is here. We have 10 to the third, 10 to the negative second, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the negative sixth, negative eighth, negative 10, negative 12th. So different scales of light. And this extends all the way in both directions. On this side and on this side, it goes infinitely in either direction. As human beings, we have purposes for light. We use light in different ways. Um, the visible light spectrum we can see here. Uh, there's the visible light spectrum in there. And so we can see only a teeny, teeny part of the spectrum. And that's the size about, I guess, um, cellular life, right? Uh, and so when I, we look at what we call the waves, um, we have radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray. So these are the broader categories. When we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, we see as the frequency increases, so we have increasing frequency, the wavelength decreases and vice versa. That should make sense. C equals lambda F. If we have an increasing frequency, we're going to have a decreasing lambda and vice versa. So with increasing wavelength, we get into radio waves. We have really long waves and they have a short frequency. As opposed to a long frequency, short wavelength, gamma rays, x-rays, these are actually rays that we use for x-rays, for looking at bones and etc. So the wavelength is used to characterize light from other light waves. We distinguish a radio wave different from a microwave, different from infrared or ultraviolet, etc. And the different wavelengths of light have been useful to humans in different ways in relation to their size. So um, if we go back to the previous, you can see radio waves. It's about the size of buildings. And that's where we want radio waves to go is around buildings. So we're going to use the light wave that corresponds to the size that we want to use them for. A microwave, notice that it will hit things in a microwave, right? We want that wave to intersect. Um, microwaves would hit the building. The mi microwaves would not go around the building. We need waves that would go around the building as opposed to microwaves where we want to actually hit things in the, our microwave. Here's a table that I found in OpenStax uh, 2013 edition that really summarizes what the different types of electromagnetic waves can be used for. Gamma rays happen in nuclear decay, etc. Um, I'm not going to go more into this to explain anything other than know that it's in OpenStax and you can come back here in this video if you want to look at it. It is really interesting what different purposes light is being used for. There's the production of it, there's applications of it, life sciences. So if you're in the life sciences, especially the medical field, you can see that there are a bunch of different uses for light. And then issues. Uh, so you can see issues over here. Uh, very interesting slide. I'll leave you to read through it on your own. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about here was the visible light spectrum. As you become more of a physics person, as you know more and more in physics, you will become more and more familiar with the visible light spectrum.
and with the light spectrum in general, especially if you're in chemistry and you look at atomic physics and have different atomic spectra, what are the specific wavelengths emitted by different atoms, right? So if we just focus on vi visible light, notice that there is an upper range for the wavelength see it's getting smaller here there's an upper range for wavelength and a lower range for wavelength green is in the center and so you may be asked or you will become familiar with red and orange being on the higher end and then yellow being in the middle and becoming more familiar like if you see a 700 nanometer as opposed to a 400 nanometer being able to distinguish where on the electromagnetic spectrum that is where in visible light what color that light is. And there's some questions that I put on homework regarding this.